Good evening, folks. It's good to see you tonight, and uh, glad to be together back with you again. I know I said I was going to try to bring Ginger with me this evening, and, and I know you're disappointed not to see her. I am, but uh, to tell you the truth, what she tried to do yesterday was uh, start plowing the backyard with her nose. She, uh, I wasn't there at the moment, which was not good, but she walked out the door and just uh, lost her balance a little bit, and boom, she went. And uh, she's fine, but she's a little sore, you know. And since I was not there like I was supposed to be, and I was out at the track walking around, I get the call. And I said, well, baby, I'm a, I'm a half a mile from the car. So it's going to, I hope I didn't tell you this this morning. But anyway, I'll tell you again. It's pretty funny. So I'll be there as soon as I can. So she, across, the, the new preacher at Hobbs Street lives directly across the street from us. So she called him, and he went over there and picked her up and took her in the house. And I told him when I got to the house, I said, I, I wonder what those people thought about that old fat man trying to run, because I'm a walker, I'm not a runner. I reserve running for when somebody is chasing. That's when I run. Anyhow, that's the reason she's not here, and she'd love to be here. She said, did they ask about me? I said, they sure did. They sure did. So thank you for that. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This is going to be the last in this little mini-series of lessons that we've gone through today on love. And, uh, you know, Revelation, I think Revelation still scares a lot of people. It shouldn't scare us because we, we're familiar with it. We've had classes on it and all that sort of thing. We know that the way it's organized is, is really not that complicated. Uh, chapter 1 deals with the introduction and the identification of Jesus Christ. He's identified by certain characteristics that he uh, maintains here. And... Uh, you know, John's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the Isle of Patmos, and he hears this voice. Verse 11, uh, the voice says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, see, that's the thing to remember about Revelation. What John writes down is what he saw. What he saw are visions that have lessons. Visions with lessons and so he says write down what you see write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia now uh, verse 11 says Asia what we would call what they're talking about today is a Turkey or Asia Minor but it's the Roman province of Asia at this particular point in history these churches were Ephesus Smyrna Pergamos Thyatira Sardis, Philadelphia, and the Laodicea. Now, each one of the churches received a personalized lesson and a point that they needed to pay attention to from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Ephesus, we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to think about that tonight. The Smyrna was a persecuted church. The compromising church was Pergamos. The corrupt church was Thyatira and uh, the dead church was Sardis. I always get that turned around in my head. The faithful church was Philadelphia. And uh, the lukewarm church, we always remember that one, was Laodicea. So we want to center in on the, on the lesson that the Lord Jesus himself gave through John, the Holy Spirit and John, to the church at Ephesus. Now we know something about the church at Ephesus before we get to Revelation. Because we have, uh, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 20, we have interaction between the Apostle Paul and the church at Ephesus. We learn something about them. Remember, Paul told them he ceased not night and day to declare the whole counsel of God to the people there in Ephesus. And uh, then we have the, the book of Ephes Ephesians itself. We can sit down and read in uh, Ephesians what Paul wrote to them to help them with their living of the Christian life. And, uh, of course, that's a great study in, in and of itself. But we get, well, what we want to do is to try to have in our minds 
when these different things were written. And there's a couple of options, and they're rather rational options, to be honest with you. We know that the book of Acts, you know, is that material is quite early in terms of the uh, revealing of the New Covenant, the New Testament. And uh, so, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, 10, 15, 20 years within the scope of the time of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then you have Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, which is somewhere probably in the 50s. I mean, it's all, you have to kind of be understanding that it depends on where you start counting and that sort of thing. But, you know, it's easy to figure out a chronology because Luke was so careful about giving us signposts in the book of Acts to tell us, you know, when things were happening according to what was going on in the Roman Empire. And so then we have the book of Revelation. We have Revelation uh, as it's set up for us by the Holy Spirit, and we have it in our Bibles. Now, it was, it was written at one of two times. There's only two options, really. And the options circle around the idea of who's doing the persecuting in the book of Revelation. And uh, our brotherhood, our, the fellows that have studied the Bible, you and me, all of us together, we can come up in a couple of things. First of all, we could say that the persecutors are the Jewish establishment, the Jewish establishment that was controlling Jerusalem before A.D. 70. Of course, after A.D. 70, there was no Jewish establishment in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was gone. The Romans sowed the fields with salt. It was gone. So that's one option, that the book of Revelation was written in that context. The other option is that it was written in the 90s, a number of years later. And uh, uh, good brethren can disagree about which one they think. I think it was written about 95 by uh, the Apostle John as he was on the Isle of Patmos. And that the persecutor in this instance is the Roman Empire, that the Romans are doing the persecuting. I think that fits better, but uh, I've, I've got dear friends that don't. I mean, uh, Jimmy Clark's one of my best preaching friends there is, and he, he throws it back before A.D. 70. <laughs> you know, one day we'll find out for sure, and I'm not going to worry about it till then. However, whenever it is, it does not change the point of the content that we are studying tonight. Because each one of these seven letters that's in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 is formulated in the same fashion. Each time John goes back, or the Holy Spirit goes back for John, and goes back to the, chap the first chapter and picks out some of the characteristics of the identification that's given of Jesus in that chapter and uses it to identify him to the people at the particular congregation. So with those things in mind, let's just take a look at the passage. Tonight's going to be one of those nights where we're just going to look at the passage. When we finish the passage, the lesson will be yours. So Jesus says through the Holy Spirit to John, John who was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? Now you go back to chapter 1, you find you've got these stars that represent the angels for the seven churches of Asia Minor. You've got a star. What does that mean? What angel? What we're we talking about here? Well, there's two things it could be. Now, I guess you say, well, there's a word angel. That's an angel. You know, an angel is a created being, created before creation was created, and that they are free will agents, and uh, you can be a faithful angel, you can be an unfaithful angel. Well, it could be that, except that this angel seems to be identified specifically with the church, the congregation that's going to receive this letter. Consequently, then we look and say, well, why does he use the word angel? Because Revelation is a is a pictorial book. Revelation, you, it's meant for you to sit when you, we, there's no TV, there's no uh, Marvel movies, there's nothing like that. All you have is your mind. And if you read the book of Revelation, you can bring in your mind the pictures that the Holy Spirit has put there for you to benefit by and to learn through. And the word angel Angelos, that's the word that's in the language here. It means messenger. Sometimes those angels that God created in the long ago, they were messengers. 
But here's a messenger. Could it be the preacher? Now, I'd like to think it was. Or it could have been the elders or a particular individual there who was specially equipped through the laying on of the hands of the apostles to receive these messages. But what John is told to do is to write this message to the angel, the church at Ephesus. And uh, what God wants done is his will in this particular situation, in each one of these cases. So he says in verse 2, These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The seven stars, these seven angels, these seven messengers, Jesus holds them. He's got, he, can, he, he controls them. He has them. And then who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That goes back to chapter 1, 2. Jesus is shown as walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now that is poetic language. This is pictorial language. This is movie language. But it's designed, it's called apocalyptic literature. It's a, it's a literary form. We have the same thing today. We've always had it. We had it before this. We'll have it, we'll have it from now on. When you, it's like when you were a kid and you were going to the, to the newsstand. Now, when I was a child, the thing I like to do, and a lot of us like to do, we'd go down to the downtown newsstand. Every town I lived in had a newsstand. You go downtown, they had newspapers from all over the state. They had books in there. That's where you could go buy books for school. There was a bookstore too, but they just called it the newsstand. And you could also go back over in there and uh, look at the comic book racks. And you know, Superman, Batman. Flash, all those things back there. There's comic books back there. And those were pictorial books for people to, to, to remember the stories by. Now, Revelation is not a comic book. No way, shape, or form. However, it is pictorial. It, still, a lot of us learn through conjuring up pictures in our minds. You know, one of the best things in the world's ever happened to me when I try to fix something around the house is YouTube. I can read the instructions all day long. They come with a piece of plumbing. You know what? You know what I end up doing every time? Calling the plumber. The man right here knows I'm going to call the plumber. But if I've got the YouTube, all I got to do is watch the picture, watch the guy fix it and fix it just like he fixed it. I can fix it. My daddy would be so proud of me. He was a master mechanic, master plumber, master electrician. Anyhow, these pictures are meant to stick in our minds. And what he says here is that Jesus is doing the talking. That's what verse 2 is about. Chapter 2, verse 2 is about Jesus doing the talking to the church at Ephesus. And he, he says uh, later and before that if, if we don't straighten up and fly right, if we're in one of these churches, we don't do what we're supposed to. He removes the candlestick. The candlestick is symbolic of faithfulness of the congregation. If we were to make a, a sort of an application today, Hop Street's got a candlestick. East Hill's got a candlestick. Everybody's got a candlestick. If we were to take that imagery and transport it to our time today. So he says, uh, I'm the one who walks in the midst of these golden lampstands. Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, as he has identified earlier. So what does he say to them? He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Jesus tells them, he says, listen. I know your works. Jesus knew that church. He knows every congregation. Every one of us. He knows this one. He knows Hobster. He knows everywhere I've ever been. And I've always tried to preach it wherever it was. I said, folks, if 
you might not want to face what's in your heart. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about people. You might not want to face what's in your heart, but you know this for sure. God knows what's in there. He knows what's in each individual's heart, and he knows what's in the heart of the congregation. And what Jesus says to them, he says, I know what you've been doing. You've been doing some good stuff. You've worked hard. Your labor, your patience, you can't bear those who are evil. That's a good thing. See, what you have in each one of these letters, you have some commendation, except for a couple of them. You have some commendation where Jesus says, I appreciate what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. You've got to keep on doing that. And he was that way about Ephesus. You read, you read the book of Ephesians, you see they did battle against evil. They fought it. And Paul told them to get ready to fight it. They had to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, to withstand in what day? The evil day, Ephesians chapter 6. So Jesus knew what they were doing, and we know what they were doing because we can read Ephesians. And remember back in Acts chapter 20, what did the apostle Paul tell the elders when he met them on the island out there? What did he tell them? He said, one day, there are going to be people that enter in among you from among yourself and they're going to lead folks astray. You're going to have to resist those people. They're going, they're going to be clever. They're going to seem like they're something they're not. And he said, I've warned you night and day about folks like that. That's what Paul said. We're talking about John here. Well, talking about Jesus here. So we know that the church at Ephesus had these kind of battles to fight. And they fought them, and they were good at it. He said, and you have persevered and have patience and labored for my name's sake and not become weary. He said, you just hung in there. Say, say this thing is around 95, or even if it's around 70, where, wherever it is. They've been fighting this fight for years. They've been standing up against uh, evil, false apostles. Now, one thing you learn if you read a little church history, particularly the church history that purports to be a record of the events that took place in the, uh, after, the first, after the church was established, after 33, after 40, after 50, after 60, and up through the end of that century, what you find out that the church was, as we say in the South, it was eat up with false apostles. One of the things a fellow liked to do if he wanted to get a little crowd behind him, if he wanted to have a little influence, a little power, a little popularity, he said, you know, I hate to, I won't bring this up, but I'm an apostle. You know, just like some of these preachers today say, well, I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. Well, there were 12 apostles. Well, it's 13, then back to 12. Back to 11. Then. You know how it got. An apostle, in this sense, is a singular activity. Now, we are all apostles in the sense of being sent by God to do God's work. But these fellows who say they are apostles and are not, they weren't apostles. And Ephesus resisted it. The good elders at Ephesus resisted that. So what does Jesus say to them all the way down through verse 3? He commands them. He commands them. Y'all, you, you all are doing a great job. Then he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. Now, you know... I remember getting some papers back that I had written and I worked hard on. And teachers writing some things up here. Good paper telling you about the good points. And then you turn over to the next page where he's been scribbling with his red pencil. And he says, but. But. And then you get the bad news kind of a letdown after you've got a little good news you start thinking maybe I'm okay here then you get the bad news that's what Jesus is doing here he says nevertheless I have this against you and what did you have against them they've left their first love 
left, he says, you have left your first love. What was their first love? Um, I believe in humility. I don't believe in false humility. But I want to tell you, I don't know precisely what that first love was. But I know what it could have been. Because it's delimited by the words themselves. First of all, it could be the love they had for the cause of Christ and the love they had for Jesus when they were first Christians. Now, do you remember when you were first baptized? Some of you, if you were baptized as a grown person, you remember that. Man, I was just revved up. I was ready to roll, weren't you? Now, when you're a little child and being baptized, or 12, 13, 14, you might forget some of those things in the intervening years. But if you think about it, you might remember them. The thing is, there was, there's a fervor when you become first a member of the Lord's church that it sometimes can slip away from you. Particularly if the world, you know, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the love of the world, that's enmity with God. We don't want to do that, but sometimes things force in on us that make us move away from that first love. It could be that. I think it, I think it probably would be that, at least in part left your first love love they had for Jesus love they had for the truth uh, their depth of dedication or maybe in light of John 13 34 which we talked about this morning and he says love one another for th by this men shall know you are my disciples Maybe they'd stop loving each other like they should. They got so busy with the work that they forgot to love each other. Now, you'll notice, and if you'll read these seven letters, that's chapters 2 and 3 tonight. If you'll read this, he never tells them to stop doing what he commands them for. He doesn't tell them, now you need to, to start loving each other. Start loving Jesus like you did at the beginning. Start loving the truth like you did earlier. He, 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 he tells them to do all of that. You've got to get going. You've got to repent and return to your first works. But he never tells them to stop hating evil or getting rid of the false apostles. You know, today in, our, in the Lord's church, there is this false dichotomy that either you're going to be a loving church or a sound church. Now, you don't know what I'm talking about. You'll either be a loving church or a sound church. What do you think God thinks of that idea? I, you know what I think he wants us to do? He wants to be a sound, loving church. Isn't that right? There's too much in the Bible about both those things. Too many instructions in the word to say that we need to be true to the book because if you're not true to the book what are you true to and then we need to be loving each other and loving the truth and loving God he tells them remember therefore from where you've fallen repent and do the first works go back like you were at the beginning when you were on fire and you loved each other when you were doing what you needed to do and you loved each other. I'm going to tell you something. It's hard to live on the mountaintop. I've got friends who uh, came into some money and they decided they're going to build them a house in the mountains. So they go up and uh, they get a hold of a contractor. Mountaintop. Don't let me forget what I'm talking about. Hard to live on the mountaintop. So they go up and they get them a contractor and say, I bought this land over here. I got five acres on top of that mountain. That's where I want my house. The guy looks at him and says, you sure you want your house up there? He says, you know how cold it gets up there in the wintertime? That's where I want my house. I want to see that view. Contractor looked at him and said, what are you going to do for water? You know, the water's down in the valley. The water's not up on top of the mountain. What are you going to do for water? You're going to have to pump it up there. It's hard to live on the mountaintop. What if you need to get to the store? You know, one night you just absolutely got to have some bluebell, butter pecan. You got to have it. But you're up on the mountaintop. You got to start the car. You got to go all the way to town down there. See, it's hard to live on the mountaintop. To artificially stimulate yourself. 
Maybe these people were trying to do that. Of course, they failed at it. But what Jesus says, go back to your first works. Go back to how you were at the very beginning. Redouble your efforts to, to be that kind of person. He said, or else I'll remove your candlestick. I'll remove your lampstand. Now, can, you know, how many congregations? Well, I don't know. You know, I'm glad we're not in the judgment business. I mean, we have to make judgments, right? We have to make decisions. Elders have to make decisions. We all do. But none of us have God's job. Is that right or not? We don't have God's job. What Jesus wanted these people to do was to get themselves back like they used to be when they were doing the whole thing. They were loving each other, and they were protecting the truth in the church and each other. That's what they needed to do. He said, you got to do that or I'll take your lampstand out. Serious business. Christianity, by the way, Christianity is not either or most of the time. It's both and with good things. But then he comes back. And here's why I think that Jesus has got a lot of hope for Ephesus. Because he comes back in verse 6. He says, but you have this. This you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. See, Jesus doesn't hate anybody. We don't hate anybody. But we can hate what people do. So even with the rebuke, he has a commendation. What they've done, good things they've done. He has a rebuke. And then he has another commendation. He commends their good work. Nicolaitans. You could look it up. Very simply, most people think that this refers to the doctrines and attitudes of a man named Nicholas of Antioch, who uh, believed in self-indulgence and Persian dualism, uh, the, the idea of Galatians 5.13 of the misuse of liberty. And if I have liberty in Christ, I can do whatever I want to do. Well, it's never that way with God. We do have liberty in Christ to do what God wants us to do. But we don't have liberty to do what we want to do just because we want to do it, because they were using liberty as an occasion for the flesh there in Galatians 5.13, and that's what the Nicolaitans were all about. And then what he, what he ends each one of these letters with, he says, he who has an ear, now everybody has an ear, some of them work better than others, you get older, they don't work as well. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So the Spirit sending this message in. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The overcomer. There's a promise to the overcomer in these letters. The promise to the overcomer. The overcomer is the one who straightens up and does what he ought to do. And this congregation, if they will overcome, if they will do it, in other words, they'll be fine. Be able to eat of the tree of life. It's symbolic for, as you know, go back to Genesis. Symbolic for the idea of you're going to be with God forevermore in eternity. Whatever that's going to be, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be what we want. It's going to be what we need. So you go back and you look at this letter. We've been talking about love all day. Love one another. Love the truth. That's what we do. We love each other. We love the brethren. We love the truth. And we stay true to that truth. And we need to understand that it could be just no, a rather common trick of normalcy. To lose the fervor for the truth that we had earlier in life. But we can get it back. And I can understand why it happens to people these days. Folks, you know, this is a tough world to live in. 
I mean, thank the Lord we live in Tennessee and Alabama. There are some places that it's, it's, it's like 20 times as hard. Is it, can you imagine trying to live in California or New York or someplace like that? And that's some mighty good folks there. But the environment's tougher. How do we face all these challenges? We face them the same way these people did. Love each other. Love one another. And we sing that song all the time. Love one another. It's a beautiful song. And we stand for what's right and good. And it's every day. It'll never change. We just keep doing that. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Keep on being faithful. And one day, what's going to happen? Right there in heaven. Right there in heaven. We'll be there with a lot of people who had to struggle just like we've had to struggle. Nobody gets a free pass. Everybody goes by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. So we pray these lessons today have been of some benefit to you. Now, if you're not a Christian, and I know probably most of you that are here and of the age of accountability are Christians, but if perhaps you're here and you've been thinking about obeying the gospel, don't let the day go by. Let me tell you something. Loving God, loving each other is the best way to get through this life. We are pilgrims, and we need that love, and we need God to get through this existence. This world is not our home. You know it's not. It's not our home. Paul said, my citizenship is in heaven. You look up that word, what it means, my passport. You know your passport when you go out of the country? Got that blue passport, State Department of the United States of America. It's the best one to have in the world. If you get a red one, it's even better. But if you got a blue one, it's really wonderful. That passport means that wherever you are, the United States stands behind you. So far, so good. But that's nothing compared to the passport we have from God. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're just living here a while. So if you need to respond to God's gospel call, it is our fervent prayer that you come as together we stand and sing.